But what's happened is that we've turned prostitution into a symbol of exploitation. And that symbolism has blinded us to, uh, you know, make any effective policies around actually reducing exploitation in the sex trade because we're so focused on eradicating it in its entirety. When the truth is that all labor exists on a spectrum of choice, circumstance, and coercion. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Ross Powell. This is Freedom, a show about ideas that matter. Freedom is an independent, listener-supported show. If you value these conversations, please consider becoming a supporter. You'll get access to episode transcripts, bonus content, and our Discord community. Learn more at freedom.audio slash join, or look for the link in the show notes. On today's episode, we get into the difficult and interesting questions around sex work. Our guest is Caitlin Bailey, a sex worker rights advocate, comedian, and writer. Caitlin is the founder and executive director of Old Pros, a nonprofit media organization creating conditions to change the status of sex workers in society. She is also the host of the Oldest Profession podcast and the creator of Whore's Eye View, a 75 minute mad dash through 10,000 years of sex worker history. For our listeners who don't know, I think it's good that we just start with who you are. Uh, and then we can get into the deep questions involving. Sure. Uh, my name is Caitlin Bailey. I'm the founder and executive director of Old Pros, and we are trying to create the conditions to change the status of sex workers in society. I'm the host of the Oldest Profession podcast, and I'm a former sex worker myself. And when we talk about sex workers, how big of cat of definition is that? Is that everything from yeah sex? Sex work is a really big, broad umbrella term that includes anyone who exchanges erotic labor for money or something of value. So, of course, that uh, you know includes standard full-service prostitution, but it also includes legal sex workers like porn performers or strippers um, or, you know, sort of uh, off-kilter sex workers, uh, dominatrixes, foot fetish models, phone sex operators— and of course, I want to include uh, Hooters waitresses because we are trying to build uh, a big tent. You said you wanted to change the status of sex workers, mm -hmm. and that status can be interpreted in in a number of ways. So there sure. is there's legal status. Yes, much of sex work is illegal, and so making it legal, decriminalizing it. But there's also social status mm -hmm. issues as well. That most sex work is considered. On the fringes of society, and rightfully so by by many people, um, in the sense that like we don't they there are a lot of people on the left and a lot of people on the right who don't want us to elevate the status of sex workers. Rather, they want us to get rid of sex work. And and so, what is the what is that broader mission? Is it just sure. are, is the focus just on decriminalization? And how and I guess how does that relate to the social status question? Sure. Decriminalization or stopping the arrests is the first priority of any sex worker rights advocate. But we really do envision a future where not only is no one arrested for engaging in this work, but also people don't lose their jobs, their homes or their children. And we believe that sex workers have so much to contribute to the communities that they're already a part of. Conversations around negotiated consent, uh, mental health. I mean, you know, I, I believe that sex workers have been at the cutting edge of every major artistic, financial, and technological innovation for all of human history. And I believe uh, that we have a lot to contribute, but the stigma and shame around our work prevents many of us from being able to make those contributions. But the first priority is to uh, call off the hunt, as it were, very literally. One of the most, there are so many interesting questions that we'll be diving into philosophically around these these questions. But uh, one I think is interesting is male versus female and per perception of if, if sex work, let's say it was mostly men doing it, I, I think it would probably be legal. Um, and I think that says something interesting about the way that women are treated, especially when they're perceived as, as selling themselves in a way that I think is different than if a man does it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I, I, I'm not sure, you know, there's, of course, many, many male sex workers. Yes. And it affects, it affects both genders. It's obviously always been a gender issue. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, I believe that whorephobia is the foundation of misogyny. And this idea around controlling the freedom of movement, freedom of expression of women um, sort of underlies much of our prostitution policy. And that, you know, many of our laws against prostitution are actually a reaction to sort of feminist liberation, right? We didn't criminalize prostitution in this country until the progressive era, the 19th century. And we did so very much as a reaction to middle class women entering the workforce. Uh, the invention of bicycles was a very destabilizing moment for nervous dads uh, around the country. And so we sort of create these false narratives um, and justify much of our patriarchal control in the the language of uh, paternalistic protection. Um, but you're right, for thousands and thousands of years, there's just more interest in controlling, uh, you know, the, frankly, sexual freedom um, of women. And so much of that is wrapped up in our anxieties around paternity, which is the, the, obvious, the obvious predecessor to, to patriarchy. It seems like, too, there is just a... An so there's the control angle, but there's an economic angle because it occurred to me as Trevor was asking his question that one of the counter arguments that gets raised when people are like, we should, you know, sex work is is dangerous. Um, it's people selling their bodies. You, we shouldn't enable that is to say like, well, what about all these things that men do? Like, you know, being a soldier for for cash, I mean, members of the military get paid, is putting mm -hmm. yourself in in harm's way in often really awful ways. Construction that work. Be okay. Or – Construction work, mine, mining. My uncle, the fisherman, the, installing the, the crab fisherman. That we watch a whole show yeah. about those people. Yes, but I, my uncle, spent his entire career installing aluminum siding in Buffalo, New York, mm -hmm. often during the winter, which is horrendous. On you know, like this is really hard work that is damaging to the body. Like, but when yes. when you make those kinds of arguments, they're they don't tend to land. Mm -hmm. People are fairly dismissive of them, and it seems like. At the same time, you can see like arguments about the the economic impact of, say, like caregiving women, mm -hmm. women, women's work, putting yes. them in air quotes, in the home as mothers and caregivers and so on. There tends to be a like that shouldn't be that shouldn't enter into the marketplace like that shouldn't be paid work. And it it seems like there is this kind of the stuff that we think of as traditionally what women do which caregiving or in or in this case providing sex is not something that we should make part of the marketplace and that it's like morally wrong to do it i think what people are actually reacting to is um you know we have real feelings around women acquiring actual purchasing power right the economic um stability the ability to leave um abusive or exploitative relationships right the ability to be an active agent in your own life i mean you know uh women married women weren't able to have their own credit cards until the mid 1970s so you know there's a lot of different kinds of economic policies around curtailing or limiting women's access to money um you know i don't think that you have to be uh, a libertarian, right, to recognize um, that, that that's wrong. Um, and I do think it's interesting that we only seem to want to discuss the corrupting influence of money when we're talking about women or other traditionally oppressed people acquiring some of it. And I would point out that, you know, sex workers have been able to exercise quite a bit of economic control hundreds of years before other women acquired property rights. Um, or the ability to move freely in society, trading respectability for access and agency. What have you seen in your time doing this with – because the, the interesting thing that's happened, and it, I wouldn't say recent, I would say 20 years, whether or not that's your theory of recent, but we've seen more opposition from for sex work from the left, from the traditional mm -hmm. left, than I think we did 20 years ago. It was obvi – obviously, you always had the preachers. And the, the the moral majority who are going to oppose sex work legalization, but it seems like we have more people on the left. Um, do you agree with that? That you see more, or is it about equal? Or I, I mean, I'm I'm a fairly historically minded person, so I would tell you that I think that this uh, alliance um, between feminists and uh, you know 
anti-vice folks dates back to the temperance movement. You know, the same group of folks that were trying to close down bars were also very focused on closing down brothels for very similar reasons. You know, we criminalized alcohol, prostitution, and abortion in this country all for very similar reasons. It certainly dates back to the porn wars of the 1970s. And Gloria Steinem, um, you know, spent uh, a, a large chunk of her career trying to criminalize porn as a symbol of violence against women and continues that crusade today, trying to push these, you know, so-called end demand laws, where we know everywhere these policies are implemented, violence against sex workers specifically and women generally increases. But yes, this is a, a very old alliance uh, between um, feminists, uh, you know, so-called liberal feminists and um, anti-porn conservatives who have found a lot to agree about over the course of the last hundred years. Sorry, but, but I, yeah, I, I hope the recent um, recriminalization um, of abortion across large swaths of this country dissuades some of my feminist colleagues from, uh, you know, believing that we can make big distinctions between, um, you know, access to health care and information about women's bodies and obscenity. And that conflation dates back to the Comstock laws of the 1870s, which are unfortunately, you know, making a, a popular resurgence. Yeah. But it does seem to be the case that a lot of these industries, so the porn industry, there is exploitation that happens in it. There are people who would – who are working in it who, if they felt they had other options, would choose those other options. Obviously, prostitution can bring with it a whole host of bad things or or people who, you know, are not happy in the role but feel like they need to be doing it. Is that – I mean that's the picture that we have and that seems to be the picture – that's that's what people are latching on to. Is it's not sure. – so from the left, it's not like kind of this prudishness or controlling of women's sexuality. It's like these are explo exploitative industries right. and we need to do something about it. But what's happened is that we've turned prostitution into a symbol of exploitation and that symbolism has blinded us to uh, you know make any effective policies around actually reducing exploitation in the sex trade because we're so focused on eradicating it in its entirety, when the truth is that all labor exists on a spectrum of choice, circumstance, and coercion. And although there are many people who could not imagine themselves engaging in this work, right, I, for example, couldn't imagine working at a slaughterhouse, but I know that criminalizing that work doesn't expand the options of any folks that are working there. And similar to abortion, uh, no amount of criminal censure or policy is going to eliminate the oldest profession, but we can make it less safe. And so much of the so-called exploitation that's associated with sex work is a direct result of criminalization and efforts at coercive control. Before criminalization, the overwhelming majority of people um, that worked and ran brothels were women. They were some of the largest property owners uh, in the West, for example, for you know a period of several decades. But when you criminalize prostitution or abortion or immigration, you end up pushing these things into the hands of criminals. And so, you know, when we criminalized prostitution starting in 1910 and then really taking off in 1917 with America's involvement in World War I, which we justified as disease control, you pushed sex work out of the primarily women-owned brothels, which were a gathering place and a, a place of refuge for women escaping abusive relationships, trying to get purchasing power for themselves. This was a place uh, where they were um, you know, often uh, giving folks harm reduction information, right, like how to prevent STIs, how to prevent unwanted pregnancy, um, a place where information about how to access abortion is kept. You push it out of the brothels and into the hands of pimps, not because uh, clients are necessarily dangerous, but because for the first time in American history, women walking alone risked, uh, risked being arrested for maybe prostitution, but also promiscuity, which was criminalized for many decades in this country. So if you were a sex worker, you needed a man in order to navigate public space and procure clients. 
that's not an inevitability of sex work. It's the direct result of criminalization. You see a very similar pattern, for example, in Nevada, right? Nevada is the only state with legal regulated prostitution, but many of those regulations come from this very horphobic perspective where we have to contain and control the people that engage in this work. And so it uh, concentrates power amongst primarily overwhelmingly male brothel owners. So Nevada, right, the only state with legal prostitution, has the highest arrest rate per capita for prostitution-related offenses. It's not, uh, a, you know, an especially liberating model. The porn industry is thriving, let's say, and is... Well... Well, I mean, well, at least in terms of minutes watched, but it is legal sure. and regulated and in places like California where much of it is made. They they are consistently passing laws to, you know, mm -hmm. protect or theoretically protect condom-wearing laws, for example. Sure. But at the same time, there's a lot of people would say this is not necessarily a good thing. Like if, if we have porn on a level that no society has ever had and there is a lot of exploitation of young women in these in this industry, even though it's a fully legal and regulated industry, and where this where this is taking society is not a good thing. So if if we did that with prostitution, that would just become another bad thing where we're just indulging and not actually trying to get better. Sure, but this isn't really a unique argument. The same can be said about the food and bev or entertainment industry, right? There's a lot of general exploitation of young and naive people. And again, you know, we were there was a brief glorious moment in the history of pornography in the early days of the internet when sex workers really for the first time were able to safely and securely develop direct relationships with clients, right? Whether they were, you know, purchasing content or negotiating time or, you know, whatever the business model was. But because of these regulatory efforts, that's really pushed a lot of porn performers or content creators into the hands of these, you know, larger, often monopolistic uh, industries that can afford to, to do compliance and, you know, to do the rigmarole of all of this. And it's actually really disempowered content creators, um, you know, not because, uh, you know, sexy stuff is uniquely exploitative, but because of all of the anxiety and, and regulatory issues, it's becoming harder and harder for independent content creators to survive and thrive on the internet. Is it wrong that, I think I have this part of my brain, uh, that that says to me, and maybe this is, you know, the whore phobia that's been instilled in me by the patriarchy, but there's a part of my brain that says that a completely conflating, exploiting a food worker and saying, and, and a young, naive food worker with exploiting a young, naive person to film sex videos or however, whatever sex work, saying those are just the same thing just seems wrong. Is oh, they're not the same thing. Okay. Sex workers have much more ability to push back against, uh, for example, sexual harassment. Well, right? one is no worse. I mean, but I'm, I'm, as a waitress. Well, no, I sure. Okay, we could we could talk about what the laws. But I'm, what I mean is that it seems like exploiting someone because they're pretty nineteen year old and and using their body is worse than get get that guy a burger. Is that just my horophobia? Right, except the prevalence of sexual harassment in Food and Bev I don't think can be ignored, right? Because it's not just get me that burger, right? It's get me that burger and you pinched my butt and there's absolutely nothing that I can say about that, right? Or sexually harassed by a boss or manager, right? I mean, there are horrific examples of sexual exploitation outside of the sex industry, but my experience in the sex industry, and this is, you know, corroborated by many of my peers and colleagues, is that when something horrific happens to us within the context of sex work, we have the ability to push back on that, right? We can put somebody on a blacklist. We can uh, report that to our community. Whereas, you know, when you're working, um, what we can't do, of course, is report that to law enforcement as a member of a criminalized class. Uh, but, you know, well, what I, we don't have to rehash the lessons of the Me Too movement to well, what I'm asking talk is about not, why people... It's not so much about food yeah. and bev. It's about conflating, it's like, including even things like, like mining, like we brought up with men and like right. way, ways yeah. that, you know, men's physical labor. So we just say, oh, this is all using bodies. 
that that's the conflation. Mm-hmm. I mean, we could could can and should strengthen sexual harassment, and we and we have to some extent. It, but let's assume we we do that with the workplace. We still have trying to protect women from making a decision at eighteen that could that could affect them way into the future. That's very no one works in a fast food restaurant and then 40 years later says, I don't want anyone to know that I worked in a fast food restaurant. So there's, there seems to be an important difference. Yeah. But we've done so much violence in the name of protecting women from their own choices. And, you know, I did sex work uh, for, you know, two sort of distinct periods of time. I've built a career around talking about that, but I'm the daughter of a soldier who spent 30 years in the military. He was deployed uh, four times to three different wars in our country's history. Um, And he was the one who was waking up in the middle of the night screaming for the last few decades of his life. And so we can talk about trauma and selling your body and exploitation, but I think it's important that we really talk about it instead of using prostitution as a symbol of all of the things that we're too afraid to face. Because there's absolutely horrific exploitation that happens across labor sectors, right? Agriculture, domestic labor, food and bev, to say nothing of the sort of professional violence that we ask of our soldiers and and law enforcement officers. But to pretend that erotic labor is this special subcategory, I think, does two things. I think it ends up blinding us to much of the actual exploitation that happens outside of the sex industry. And then also by conflating adult consensual sex work with the horrific crime of human trafficking, you end up hurting the people that you claim to want to help, right? The fastest way to trap somebody in a life of prostitution is to arrest them for it. It seems picking up on Trevor's point, though, that this is one of the things that I have remarked on in the past is how much the Western world even even the parts of it that consider themselves to be robustly secular have internalized this Abrahamic faith-based perspective on – I mean on all sorts of things, but on women and women's sexuality is just like baked into the way that we see the world. And, and so much of this is just there is something sinful about women's sexuality, about a sexually liberated – woman. I'm thinking like there was a Reason Magazine years ago did a whole like this kind of debate thing about fusionism and whether libertarians needed kind of conservatism. And and the the lead essay in it, which was quite bad and poorly argued, um, its main thing was these libertine libertarians don't want to socially shaming young women who get into sex work, but that's necessary for like the health of society. Which is just, I think, it's some like obviously wrong in in the sense that like they're not saying that about young men who are sleeping with lots of partners. Um, it's just this like internalized, very Christian worldview that I think is really without foundation, without mm-hmm. real moral foundation. But we're like stuck in thinking that way, and that manifests as there is like there is something fundamentally different about this kind of thing or or that sexuality sexual work is different from violent work like that's you know the way that we television is full of violence but people right. are super prudish about like anything sexually related and i think it's a really unhealthy way of looking if anything we we should be condemning violence more and celebrating or and celebrating sex more right like yeah 100% yeah i just don't believe that people that make other people come are like the thing that's tearing society apart i don't think that was true during the time of abraham i don't think that was true during the time of jesus and i don't think that's true right now i think that these periodic moral panics that we have around sex and sexuality are really you know our own projection and our own unwillingness to face the things that we have actual anxiety about um Yeah. And and I I would go further and say that, you know, this sort of coercive control masquerading as concern, right, for women is less about uh, sex in particular and more about our real anxieties about women acting as active agents in their own lives. We don't like public women, not as a synonym for prostitution, but very literally women taking up public space. And so so many of these concerns, again, it, you know, it comes across as as concern or 
you know, what about, uh, you know, what about your reputation or what if you regret it? And we don't do any of that for folks that engage in, um, again, really violent work. You know, we lionize, um, you know, people that, that join the military or the police force and we don't talk about like, you know, what if you what if you regret it? And and maybe it's because I grew up in a in a household with somebody suffering from PTSD, but all of the things that people said would inevitably happen to me as a sex worker didn't, but they very obviously happened to my father and we didn't have any language for that. So I think that we should absolutely be concerned about, again, trauma and exploitation. But by narrowing our focus and, again, turning sex work into this rich symbol, that has allowed us to ignore those very real problems when they don't present themselves, you know, in this sort of like white slave propaganda way. There's also a circularity to the reasoning because and this goes back to my status question at the beginning is we – one of the reasons it is hard to de to get people to change the laws on sex work is because sex work is low status in the cultural sense and people like don't want to do anything that looks like you're supporting it. Um, but – and then the arguments – often the arguments about like – so Trevor's point about people kind of will later regret having done sex work in a way that they might not later regret having done fast food work or whatever – all of that is simply because we have chosen to make this thing shameful. Correct. And then we use the fact that it is shameful purely by choice to argue that people shouldn't do it because they're going to suffer consequences right. from that. And therefore – but then that people aren't doing it is why it's shameful and we're just trapped in this really kind of nonsense, self-reinforcing yeah. moral worldview. We like to make the lie true. Right. Like, don't do drugs because you might be arrested. OK, well, stop arresting people for doing drugs. Has anyone tried that? And we've done a very, very similar thing with prostitution. Right. Like, don't don't engage in sex work. You might lose your kids. Right. Don't engage in sex work. You might lose your apartment or you might, you know, make it impossible for you to, to hold down a, a different kind of job. And before that, during the American plan, when we criminalized promiscuity in this country, right, we were um, you know, sort of snatching women um, off of off of the street, forcing them to undergo uh, medically questionable STI tests and then poisoning them with mercury. So it became this thing of like, oh, please don't do prostitution or you might die of mercury poisoning. It was like, well, has anyone tried not poisoning the prostitutes with mercury yet? That seems like the obvious solution here. So I, I think you're absolutely correct that None of this shame or stigma or criminality is innate or an inevitable result of sex work in and of itself. Instead, it is the direct result of that criminalization and stigma. And that stigma is directly tied and has been used for thousands of years to limit not just sex workers' access to the public sphere, but women's access to the public sphere. I could be someone, though, who thinks that all the legal reforms that you advocate for should happen for the purpose of safety and autonomy and all those things. And thinks public health. Yes. And thinks that sex work should be shamed. You could have both those opinions, right? It's sort of like mm -hmm. believing all drugs should be legalized and still trying to tell people they shouldn't do drugs. And sure. And so but and it seems a little bit more difficult to try to go for the no shaming side. Because I also think it's important to not shame people who use drugs. But mm -hmm. When it comes to not shaming people who do sex work, it's so ingrained. And you could, you know, I, I wouldn't argue like an inevitability based on human biology. But as you said, paternity, like why do we treat women differently? Changing that seems impossible. Changing the laws, doing it. But trying sure. to get people to think differently about the status of women in society or that they should and say that, you know, men's men, men are being oppressed too. men's bodies are oppressed by war. Sure. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, we don't shame that. And then a woman who uses her body for a different purpose, um, just saying we should not shame any of it or we should shame all of it. Maybe we should shame soldiers more and sex workers. Right. I mean, you know, and so, not shaming is is a very different thing than than legalizing. Sure. 
And I'm not sure you can get there in any society made of human beings. And does that matter? We believe that changing minds is a necessary and critical step in order to drive the cultural and legislative breakthroughs that we need to secure human rights uh, for sex workers. And we also believe that media art and storytelling are powerful levers for shifting beliefs and breaking down these taboos, right? And I believe that it is important and necessary for sex workers in particular to be able to reclaim our legacy as community builders. You know, we have this narrative that sex workers are always, you know, low status, desperate, helpless victims, you know, pushed between a rock and a hard place, uh, forced to do the most unthinkable thing, when in reality, sex work has funded more artists, entrepreneurs, and students than all of the grants in human history combined. We have made real important contributions in, um, you know, artistic worlds. Uh, we were some of the, the biggest philanthropists, again, in the West as the largest landowners. We have been community builders and visionaries. You don't have to agree that, you know, all sex workers are, you know, somehow the, you know, embodiment of uh, the sacred whore or healers or, or any of that to recognize that sex workers have had a hand in shaping history. Whether you want to acknowledge that or not, it's just an undeniable fact. So one of the things that we focus on um, at Old Prose is reclaiming and elevating this history. Our goal legislatively is to end criminalization, right? Decriminalization means that no one is arrested, evicted, fired, or loses custody of their children just for engaging in this work, which does free us up, right, to respond to sexual predators, kidnapping, um, other forms of uh, horrific trafficking or violence. But we don't need everyone in society to recognize sex workers as high status for them to recognize that sex workers are already members of their community. And that's the thing about sex workers is, you know, although we are members of a criminalized class, we have always been and will continue to be literally everywhere. We are in every social strata. We are in every community. We are in every geographic area. I mean, it, it's, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say. I want to take a moment. I'm going to get on my soapbox for a moment sure. and, and run with this in slightly in a way that's pushing back on Trevor and picks up on something, Caitlin, you and I were talking about before we hit the record button, uh, which is, I think that it is damaging to the cause, not just of, of sex worker rights and liberation, but a lot of a lot of other kinds of issues. We go back to anti-racism. We could go to trans rights, gay rights, et cetera, to argue them purely within a legal context or within kind of an acknowledging of the shamefulness but sort of context. So we can say – so like drug use, we can – one way to argue for for liberalization of drug laws is to say like, yes, drugs are bad in all these kinds of ways, but it is wrong to be criminalizing them either because it's a it's rights violation or it has deleterious social effects. Um, we can say, yes, it would be great if if like these women who are in sex work weren't doing something like this, but we should decriminalize it. And so we basically acknowledge the the validity of the social stigma on this stuff and then argue from the legal side of it. But I think that just pro on the one hand it prolongs the the suffering of the people in these these shameful and often and then criminalized communities um but it also is just I think it has a degree of just being kind of unethical in it because the fact is that believing that peaceful drug use is is a moral wrong is in, is itself a moral wrong. Believing that being transgender is a moral wrong is itself a moral wrong. Believing that se freely chosen sex work is a moral wrong is itself a moral wrong. And so we shouldn't be arguing from within the context of a moral wrong, but instead pointing it out in the same way that like it would have been, we shouldn't have said, yes, most people oppose interracial marriage. And it is the case that it's probably something shameful about interracial marriage, but it should be decriminalized. Rather, we say, no, there is absolutely nothing shameful 
about interracial marriage. Correct. And from a political strategy point, I believe that legislation will flow downstream of culture on this one. I think that legislators are terrified of their own constituents, even when you uh, do a, a good job of convincing them, right, that all of the studies suggest that if you want to reduce violence against women, if you want to reduce STIs, then the only policy that achieves those goals is the decriminalization of adult consensual sex work. Even when they look at these peer-reviewed studies from all over the world, even when we see the results, they're afraid of the social narrative around sex work. And that's why I think it's so important for us to focus on the on status, right, on stories and shifting the narrative and pushing back and moving the Overton window. It's not my job to reaffirm, right? conservatives or liberals' uh, visceral anxieties around the world's oldest profession. It is my job to simply insist that we have always been here, and many of us have been major contributors uh, to the societies and the cultures that we're a part of. But to dovetail off Aaron's question and play some devil's advocate, there is a, I mean, as someone who's worked on drug policy for years, one similarity between the anti-drugs and the drugs that are prohibited and then prohibiting sex work is a judgment that it's a particularly titillating euphoric type of experience. And if you did spend your entire life on heroin or some sort of extremely just amazing drug, be imagine the most amazing drug ever. If it doesn't exist, it just makes you feel constantly good. And that's all you did. And that's one reason why we have to stop people from doing that. We, we have, it's so titillating. It's so good that living your life just in a hole of false pleasure is a bad thing. And I think similarly with sex work, if you just spent your entire day uh, masturbating to uh, porn stars or OnlyFans or going to prostitutes, people would say that's not a life well lived, which is why, A, we're going to prohibit it, and B, we will shame it. And the, the shaming part is interesting because if I if someone told me all they do every day is masturbate, I wouldn't be like, you go bodily autonomy. I have no judgment. Sure. I have no judgment whatsoever about that, right? I have no judgment whatsoever. And and again, that's another I think that's a very deep reason why this is not perceived like being a soldier. Because that's not a you know, maybe there are psychopaths who join the army or the police. There definitely are, but but that's not why most people are doing this. It's not giving them some euphoric high. And everyone knows how good sex feels, or hopefully they do, or will at some point. And that just seems like something that you shouldn't do all the time or encourage, and that's why we shame it. Skipping over the physiological limitations of what it would mean for especially like a cis man to masturbate all day. Um, good luck with that. Um, I, I don't think it might be causing individual harm and people can choose to waste their life in a variety of ways, right? Whether it's playing video games or watching porn or doing drugs or, you know, uh, there are a thousand ways to waste your life, right? But if we are really truly afraid of euphoria, right, or euphoric pleasure, then that also sets a foundation for criminalizing or outlawing all kinds of art. Um, and so, you know, I think that there is something really beautiful about dedicating your life to the pursuit of pleasure. I think that there's sort of more there than dedicating your life to, I don't know, enforcing borders or uh, forcing people to comply with dumb laws. Um but uh, even if that is a waste of a human life, I think that it is sort of the cost of liberty that we allow people to waste their life um, however they want. As you were saying that, it occurred to me this even this ties into that earlier point about women or I'll say, I guess, feminized, like the lower status of that, because – there are definitely, you know, so we would we would look down on the person who samples heroin every day, but like the sommelier who dedicates their life to wine, we tend not to look down on. We celebrate that. And maybe you could argue, well, the sommelier is not like getting intoxicated on wine. All Depends the time. on the sommelier, yeah. right? But but the the examples that you gave of like a life dedicated to pleasure in an aesthetic sense, the 
the artists and so on, we often tend to view that as the kind of this a feat non-masculine and and there are people of for whom that is like it's it's a high status thing to be doing that but they are the ones in these weird non-masculine cosmopolitan coastal enclaves that get sneered at and and so it does seem like a lot of this is just bound up in like there's kind of a manly way to be which is violent and physical work so we don't we don't sneer at the person who dedicates themselves to athletic pursuits, even though that is like every long distance runner talks about the runner's high as a like a big factor of why they're so into it. Um, we and this this like stoic sort of like non emotional, and so all of those lives of like pure pleasure are everything that that is not, and so then are sneered at. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. And I think that there's something about sex work that, um, again, this is something that's older than money. It's about deep connection, the kind of emotional intelligence that's required um, at all levels of this craft, not only just to keep yourself safe, but also, you know, from a, a client and, and sales perspective. So I have a lot of regard for sex workers across the social strata. And I think the sommelier example is is really apt. You know, the the full spectrum of status exists in sex work, right? From, uh, you know, exploited uh, you know, busboys or folks who have, you know, their bosses holding their passport or garnishing their wages, all the way up to executive chefs, Um and the full spectrum of, of feelings is also associated with this work. But this, the social cultural narrative that we have around it um, has not succeeded in reducing uh, the amount of sex work that happens or in alleviating any harm and suffering that's associated with it. It's only compounded those things. In your studies of history, have you found any society or period of time where male sex workers were treated with similar disdain as female sex work. Because it is interesting, and, and in many sure. ways, like we talk, homophobia, patriarchy are at the bottom of this. But if you learned that, you know, a, a woman is a porn star, there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are going to be like, she's dirty. But if you learn that a man is a porn star, there's a lot of people who say, badass. And that, that dichotomy is, in many ways, at the, at the core of this. Or just to pick that up, the the difference in the way that stories about a um, male teacher, male high school teacher sleeping with a student, and but then when there's stories of a female high school teacher sleeping with a student, you get all these kind of, especially on like the conservative media, like like right exactly. on, or there's nothing wrong with her. Or when I was 16, I would have loved to sleep with my teacher kind of reactions. Right, which is, you know, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, most of the sort of criminalization around male sex workers have been wrapped up in our, you know, various gay panics that have happened, right? Whether you're talking about the 1800s or the 1920s or the 1940s and 50s. So much of the legislation or crackdown um, around male sexual service providers have a lot more to do with the criminalization um, of homosexuality. The Cannes Laws in Louisiana, I think, are a really great example of this. They were written around the 1850s in an effort to crack down on the gay male hustler scene in New Orleans. Cannes stands for um, Crimes Against Nature. Uh, but in the 1980s or 90s, those same laws began being applied to black and trans sex workers in Louisiana. And this, of course, culminated during the you know Hurricane Katrina in 2005 when thousands of black women were turned away from shelters as registered sex offenders for these cans laws violations um rent boy was famously seized in the early 2000s several years before Backpage was seized by the fbi so we absolutely have examples of criminalization but we have less interest in controlling the sexual behavior of men so the tone of that enforcement is different but it absolutely exists in terms of the criminalization of you know, male sex workers that provide services to, um, you know, women. I haven't heard a lot about that. The examples of this across history are um, rarer. I think that has a lot more to do with the limitations around women's purchasing power than it has to do with, like, 
you know, innate differences between the sexual appetites of men and women, although, you know, those differences also exist. Um, but most male sex workers provide services to male clients. Um, you know, to Marcus, which, who's a uh, famous, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a brain fart right now. I cannot remember if he was Greek or Roman. Uh, but he was censored by the the Senate for engaging in sexual services in his youth. So, you know, the stigma goes back a long way. But again, the criminalization of male sex workers has a lot more to do with our anxieties around homosexuality than it has to do with controlling the kind of sex that, or, you know, men having sex. What about human trafficking? You mentioned it mm-hmm. casually, but we, we consistently hear, you know, big numbers very scary stories of human trafficking connected with the now of course if you legalized that could change you know these black markets but absolutely the fact that there are that you could still have an exploited woman you know brought from a different country or put into a a situation Mm -hmm. even in a legal market but is it a huge problem right now that we hear the way we hear about it So much of what we hear about human trafficking, especially the conflation between human trafficking and prostitution, is a a lie. Uh, There's a lot of bad numbers and bad statistics and bad storytelling around this. A lot of this dates back to the white slave panic and the white slave law of 1910. Um, We really want to characterize black men, immigrant men um, as kidnappers of women. But the reality is that most sex trafficking in this country looks a lot more like domestic labor than it does like other forms of uh, labor trafficking. And according to the Labor Department's own numbers, the overwhelming majority of people who are violently trafficked in this country work as domestic laborers or in textiles or in agriculture. So we do have a trafficking problem in this country. It's just not concentrated or even overrepresented in sex work. There are examples of people being exploited in sex work, and my argument is that much of that is exasperated or enabled by the criminalized nature of this work. If sex workers were able to report crimes committed against them, or if we were not members of a criminalized class, we would have more negotiating power and more tools. Um, to help reduce exploitation and keep ourselves safe. This parallels a lot of the arguments about trans issues right now because there are lots and lots of people who are very concerned about like children being mutilated and kids on puberty blockers. And it turns out like the actual numbers are vanishingly small. Um, It's, you know, it's like it's it's a total moral panic, but there because it's this moralized moral panic, just like the panic about sex work, people are kind of caught up in it and it seems to like reinforce like confirmation bias just ratchets up in those sorts of situations. And so how do you how do you get people listening to data that is basically contradicting kind of their entire worldview on a particular matter that they see as of primary moral importance? I mean I mean, I think that you're absolutely right that the parallels between uh, sort of our trans panic right now and sex panic um, are very, very similar. And, you know, we've we've done this periodically throughout history, right? Satanic panic, witch burnings, right? We've 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 gone through many cycles of this as a um, as a species. Um, My favorite statistic around trans issues is that um, if what we care about is the sexualization of children, which we're defining as under 18, then we really ought to be looking at like breast augmentation, of which there are 30,000, uh, you know, cis young ladies uh, that get breast augmentation before their 18th birthday, whereas there are only, I think it's 300 or 400, some tiny percentage of people that like, for example, get top surgery um, or gender affirming care in that way. So I, I absolutely agree with you that like our imagination sort of outpaces the actual data on this. Um, one of the stats that I like to tell people is that 90% of the federal government's uh, trafficking prevention budget in 2020 was used to arrest consensual adult sex workers. Um, it was not used to detect traffickers or assist victims in any way. And I think a really great example of what this looks like is the Robert Kraft thing that happened in South Florida several years ago. You know, this is an example of uh, five different law enforcement agencies, right? Three local police departments, the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, 
all of which invested months of surveillance, right, studying these legally licensed uh, Asian massage parlors in South Florida, coordinated an undercover operation uh, where law enforcement officers were able to receive sexual services um, on the job at taxpayer expense, and then did a coordinated raid where they publicly humiliated 200 men threw themselves press conferences, lauding themselves as heroes for rescuing, you know, sex slaves. When the dust settled, the only people who were facing criminal charges were the 19 women who had been ostensibly rescued from this situation, all of whom were legally licensed masseurs operating legally uh, in South Florida, some of whom were sometimes uh, providing sexual services for extras. Nobody arrested uh, was under the age of 30. Um, And this is what our so-called anti-trafficking efforts look like in the United States. And as a taxpayer, I have a lot of questions about the way that law enforcement is used to police the aggressively consensual sexual choices of adults happening behind closed doors. I would much prefer that anti-trafficking energy being used to look into, uh, I don't know, for example, the hiring practices of the third-party contractors that Marriott Hotel uses to to clean their hotel rooms. That is probably an area that is more rife with exploitation than massage parlors. So where is this done the best in terms of countries' policies? Because you have throughout Western Europe, I don't know the data, but I know it's legal in Germany, obviously, Amsterdam, um, it, I mean, it's legal in different ways. And you talked about sure. that even in, in Nevada, it's not optimal for various reasons. Yes. So, where, so nor where... is it optimal in, in Amsterdam or Germany, right? Legalization or regulation, right, is not uh, – does not necessarily increase the negotiating power of sex workers. Rather, it sort of corrals sex workers into these um, these other forms of, of control and exploitation. So so Excuse what – so if, is there a place that does that correctly? And if there's not, yes. where, where – where what should we be doing instead of empowering, you know, big brothels and things like that? There – There absolutely is. New Zealand, I think, is the best example. They decriminalized adult consensual sex work in 2003, um, and they did it in a way that that really allowed independent uh, practitioners to sort of set their own rules and and operate. Uh, So in New Zealand, if you want to engage in sex work and you just sort of wake up on a Tuesday and negotiate at a bar and something bad happens to you, you can report that crime uh, to law enforcement because you have not committed any crimes. It doesn't matter that you didn't get a license. It doesn't matter that you're not registered. However, if you're a sex worker who is working with more than three other people, then you have to apply for a business license and then all of the labor laws that already exist in New Zealand um, apply to you. Um, There are a couple of extra laws around, uh, you know, encouraging, um, you know, safe sex practices, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody is facing criminal charges for just engaging in this work. Um, Another great example of the sky not falling down uh, when you decriminalize prostitution is what happened in Rhode Island, actually, between 2003 and 2009. It's a little bit of a complicated story. That's a combination of sort of, um, you know, litigation on behalf of a sex worker rights organization and congressional inaction and judicial decision. But there was a period of time in Rhode Island between 2003 and 2009 where it was not illegal to provide sexual services uh, behind closed doors. And during that period of time, we've studied it, gonorrhea rates dropped uh, 40 percent and reported rapes dropped 30 percent. And the sky did not fall down in Rhode Island. So how do we change the social stigma? How do we change the social attitudes? I mean, I agree that it's downstream and and I spend a lot of time talking about drug war that the first thing we have to do is stop shaming drug users, but it's very difficult to make that happen. Maybe the first thing we have to do is change the laws and then people will get a different perspective. I mean, how can we change their attitudes about this, the the whorephobia, the patriarchy? I mean, it's a big question, but where do we start? I think that we can start by changing the stories that we tell about sex workers. There are so many examples throughout history and, you know, many of my contemporaries who are, you know, excellent um, writers, performers, or entrepreneurs. So we can start elevating the stories of sex workers. 
And I think that we have to go through a very similar process that the LGBTQ plus community went through. Um, whether you uh, want to acknowledge this or not, I can almost guarantee that many of your listeners already know and probably like a sex worker who is already a member of your community. But because of the history of, of stigma and shame, that person might not be out. So I think that as we start to erode this social stigma, as we start to make inroads through, you know, state and federal legislators, um, you know, in, in the country, you're going to start hearing from more of those sex workers. And I think that is really the long and difficult path uh, to changing the status of sex workers. And we hope to elevate those stories through the Oldest Profession podcast and the stories that we choose to tell. And we also hope to empower our would-be allies by making these talking points and important pieces of information more accessible. Um, and you can learn more about that at oldprosonline.org. Thank you for joining us on Freedom. This is a listener-supported show. If you'd like to get access to episode transcripts, bonus content, extended conversations, and our Discord community, go to freedom.audio/join.